I don't know if the metaphor worked, Ben. Who knows? Either way, you got all these scary things on one hand, but you got central banks around the world saying they are ready to defend. In the end, who do you think has more firepower in the markets? Well, first of all, I think the, the analogy really does work very well, and I, I wish I'd thought of it. Um, <laughs> Thank I think you. you're absolutely correct. You've got these two different actors on, on both sides. Um, and for me, I think the, the question about whether the Fed and central banks can um, rescue things um, actually needs to be split into two parts. I think actually the, the Fed and central banks around the world can do a lot to appease markets. But I think the Fed and a lot of central banks around the world cannot do a lot now to save the real economy if we do en end up heading into a significant recession. And the reason that I think that is because if you look around the world and you look specifically at the US, um, we see that consumers and corporates are really not struggling at all with high debt costs. What they're struggling with is the fear that this trade war is going to get worse and perhaps it moves into the capital account as has been muted over recent uh, weeks. Um, and if that, that is really denting um, confidence and that is denting sentiment. And that is not something that the Fed can, um, can, can deal with and can, can help with at, at the moment. Um, but on the, financial, on the market side, well, easier monetary policy, QE, even if it's not quite the traditional way that we're used to, I think that still helps um, equities and I still think that helps um, bond markets. But it doesn't necessarily help the real economy. Yeah, there is a big difference, is there not, Ben, between the stock and bond markets and the actual economy? Do you believe that the ECB and the Fed yeah. have the ability to help the economy? I'm not talking about the stock market. I'm talking about the men and women in Newcastle or in Davenport, Iowa. Can they help those? I really don't think they can. I mean, as I say, these, these consumers at the moment, they're, they're not struggling with high debt costs. I mean, interest rates have been low for, for such a period, long period of time now. There's not the, the pent-up demand to go out there and spend at a, at a 25 basis point, even a 50 or even a 75 basis point cut. is not going to materially affect um, mortgage costs. It's not going to materially affect credit card costs or auto loan costs. So there's not going to be a lot more money in, in the pocket of consumers tomorrow or in the, next, in the coming months that they're then going to go out and spend. There's just not that marginal propensity to go out and spend um, uh, right now. So I don't think the, that um, the central banks can um, do an awful lot to, uh, to help the real economy. And that's why we are now shifting narrative from monetary stimulus towards fiscal stimulus. And if we do get fiscal stimulus coming down the pipe, um, then that is something that I think can help the, the real economy. And I think that's where we need to direct our attention going forward. Well, listen, it's, it's October 9th, and we've got Brexit. You might have heard about it. It's coming up on October 31st. My guess is, guys, you know, financial folks like yourself, Ben, if you went to your bosses and said, I'd like to take some time off between now and the end of the month, they're going to say, are you insane? How are you guys prepping for Brexit? Is there any way to, that anybody has been able to quantify the likely impact if, indeed, we just get the hard snap on October 31st? Yeah, I mean, the, the Brexit conversation is exceptionally difficult. And I think one of my colleagues um, put it best um, last year. He said, if you think you understand and you've got a strong view on what is going to happen with Brexit, you just really have not been paying attention. Um, there is no way that anybody has a really str um, strong view on how the politics are going to pan out in the next, I think you said it was 17 days until the 31st. Um, who knows what's going to happen in the next two or three hours, in fact, on Brexit. So I think what that is, uh, means for us is that we're kind of sitting on the sidelines when it comes to UK assets, particularly sterling and particularly um, UK equities. And when I go around the world and I speak to a lot of um, investors right now, they're doing exactly the same. It's just not worth the bet um, at the moment because if we do get a crashing out on um, the 31st and, and it's not clear that that's not going mm -hmm. to happen, Obviously, Johnson is sticking very firmly to this idea that it is do or die on the 31st of October. Um, but obviously, I, I think a lot of this is potentially just a sort of rhetoric ahead of the time. And then either some deal is done or probably more likely um, an extension um, is put in place. And then we get an election um, sometime towards the end of this year. Well, the outcome for Sterling can range anywhere between 110 and 130 in that scenario. Is that a bet that you really want to take? It's, it's not a bet that I want to take at the moment. That's not something that I would feel comfortable going to my investors and saying, this is my view, this is what I'm going to do, and put a significant amount of money in there. I, I just don't think that is prudent investing. Yep, and yet markets still remain higher. Ben Jones, we appreciate your insight and maybe the most yep. honest comment that we have heard on CNBC in a while. If you think you know what's going to happen, then you really haven't been paying attention. Whoever that colleague is, thank him or her for me. Ben, thank you. Appreciate it.